The Second International was founded in Paris, France in 1889. At Paris, workers from trade unions and political parties across the world, though still mainly in Europe, created the tradition of International Workers' Day, or May Day, to be celebrated on May 1st. This would be followed 21 years later with the inception of International Working Women's Day. Politically, they passed resolutions calling for universal suffrage in all countries that didn't have it, and in countries that did, for socialist parties to run in parliamentary elections. They also resolved to oppose warmongering between capitalist nations. It was these last two policies that would later divide the international. Many of the delegates were from recently formed political parties, and the biggest and most successful of these was the Social Democratic Partei Deutschland, or German Social Democrats, founded by Wilhelm Liebknecht. The SPD became a major force in German politics as workers joined the party in droves. And joining the SPD wasn't just a political affiliation, it was practically a way of life. There were socialist youth clubs, sport clubs, and even choirs where they sang socialist songs. Once the SPD was allowed to run in elections, it gained an increasing amount of seats in the Reichstag, and though they weren't allowed to form government, they used their political influence to gain reforms for the workers. It was a model of success that workers in other countries such as Austria would emulate. The SPD was the most dominant party in the international, and its chief theoretician, Karl Kautsky, was dubbed the Pope of Marxism as he defended the theory from dissenting socialists such as Edward Bernstein, who tried to prove much of it wrong. Threats to Marxist orthodoxy did not just come from theoreticians, however. The more socialists won at elections, the closer they came to working with bourgeois governments. This became especially scandalous when French socialist Alexandre Milleron took a cabinet position in the national government alongside an army general who commanded the bloody repression of the Paris Commune. The international resolved that it is sometimes permissible to participate in bourgeois government, but the matter was far from settled. One country that didn't have to worry about this yet was Russia. There, Vladimir Lenin, Julius Martov, and others met in secret to form the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. The Tsarist autocracy didn't even let them legally exist, let alone give them a parliament to run in. Not only this, but the party divided into two factions at its second congress, with Martov leading the Menshevik faction, and Lenin, the Bolsheviks. Factions were developing in the other parties as well. Liebknecht's son, Karl, came to lead the left wing of the SPD, along with Polish émigré Rosa Luxemburg, who called for a mass strike in Germany. But the SPD was so opportunist by then, they only committed to vague slogans. They were so focused on winning incremental reforms, they started to act less like a socialist party of revolution, and more like a bourgeois party. This problem was especially troubling when it came to the struggle against militarism and war. The International reaffirmed its stance against causing war, but couldn't agree on a concrete plan to stop it, other than calling for popular militias to replace standing armies. It was this lack of united action against war that would become the International's tragic undoing. The naivete of the Second International was shockingly revealed when World War I broke out, and socialist parties were forced to take a side either with or against their national governments. While many socialists assumed that their representatives would oppose war, the politicians increasingly felt caught up in the nationalist fervor that affected even the working class. The French socialist leader Jean Gerard tried to stop France from mobilizing for war, but was assassinated by a nationalist. The French section of the Second International then entered into a sacred union supporting the government throughout the war. British anti-war leader Ramsay MacDonald resigned as leader of the Labour Party to be replaced with Arthur Henderson, who then joined the wartime cabinet. On August 4, 1914, the German SPD joined the other parties in the German Reichstag, unanimously approving the motion for war credits. While the party didn't have enough votes to defeat the motion, they completely betrayed their long-standing anti-war policy by making no attempt to resist the war. In fact, they called for a patriotic peace between the German workers and the ruling class, promising not to organize any strikes throughout the war. Anti-war socialists on the left were outraged. With the socialists of opposing sides at war with each other by supporting their respective governments, the Second International was effectively dead. Anti-war socialists such as Lenin met in Zimmerwald, Switzerland, starting the Zimmerwald Left, other socialists from the Allied, Entente, and Neutral countries had their own separate congresses during the war. During the interwar years, they reformed as the Labour and Socialist International. Then after World War II, the parties of the Second International regrouped again to form the current Socialist International, which includes most social democratic parties across the world today.
Mit uns da. 